Bird. Okay, all right. I, I think it says it's recording. So, um, all right. So, hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm double checking that it's actually doing the thing. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing well. So, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank um, Jennifer Pringle for leading the meeting last month. Um, I was at our um, our state library conference and our we were the Pines team was presenting and our presentation was literally I think at the same time as this meeting so um, so thank you to Jennifer for doing that for us um, I appreciate it and I I now that we're recording I went back to try and watch the recording to make sure that I caught up and try not to duplicate anything um, reports wise or whatever that we talked that you guys talked about last month but if I do just let me know as we go along. Um, the other first thing I wanted to just point out, if um, you haven't seen it yet, I can't remember if I posted it to the listserv or not, is, um, so like I said, since we're recording our meetings now, um, they are on the um, the Evergreen um, YouTube channel. Is it this one? It's this one. Um, so the Evergreen um, Library System YouTube channel and we have our own playlist for the ACK interest group. So if you ever want to go back and watch a meeting that you missed or anything like that. Um, and I'm also trying to like once they're uploaded to YouTube to actually like link to them on the wiki so you can get to them either place. So, um, so yeah, just want to let you know that first. So let me go over to our agenda real quick. Okay, so um, as as usual, just um, there wasn't a whole lot of bug activity since our last meeting. Most of it was um, the extra good kind, which is things that got fixed release and actually went into um, 310. All of the things that are in this fixed release, um, fixed released um, area, all went into 310 beta. Um, so, but we'll just touch on the other ones real quick. Um, so as far as things that are new since we last met, um, the we're, there's three. So this first one is about um, reporting tags in purchase orders. So um, we, uh, the Pines team actually met with one of the library systems in Georgia that is not part of Pines and it's a big library system. <clears throat> and um, and I was kind of learning a, a little bit more about like what other ILS ILSs do. Um, and so I was asking on the listserv about how like the fund structures and things worked. And so I got some really awesome feedback and thank you to, to whoever um, responded to me there. Um, and so this sort of like caught my interest like um, kitten with a ball of yarn, um, this reporting tags in purchase orders. Um, <clears throat> and basically like, if I recall correctly, my own thought process here is that like for Pines libraries, at least they need to track like multiple layers of like funds kind of, right? So we've got um, funding sources and funds, um, but in funds, they're, they're like lumping like three different things together. So like if they need to know the branch that it's adult, and a lot of them track whether it's like money from the state or whether it's money from like local funders. So <clears throat> they'll lump all that into one fund code. And then that just means you have to have a fund, different fund code for each one of those like distinctions. So you just end up, so I have libraries that end up with like 200 funds. So anyway, the point of this reporting tags thing was, can we branch off some of those things into like tags? rather than having them in funds. So that's kind of the idea here, if I recall correctly. <laughs> um, and then also adding like a library setting of, if you wanna use this, then you should have to use it, you know? But like, if you're not using it, then that's fine. It's not like required in your purchase order. So basically like, if you're gonna use it, it should be required. If you're not using it, then you don't have to worry about it. So, um, but that's, that's what this, uh, like wish list was it was sort of born out of that discussion of like well these other ILSs do it this way and sort of trying to think of a way to sort of bridge that gap in functionality um and 
uh, by the way, if, if you have any discussion that anybody wants to talk on any of these, totally stop me, by the way. I have a question, Tiffany. Yes, please. Um, so are you envisioning that staff would assign these tags at the line item level or assign them to the funds, which would then apply them to the line items? I was kind of thinking on the line item level, like kind of thinking of um, like <clears throat> in the similar way that like we can assign um, surf well, modifiers. Um, so it would kind of replace the free text collection field that I don't know if anybody actually uses. Yeah, it's yeah, it that could. You could actually like have a restricted list for. Right, exactly. So like, and then also I would want it to be something that like, if they're assigning, uh, you know, branches and stuff on the um, on the vendor site, that they could assign that as well, and that would pre-populate for them, so they don't necessarily have to, you know, do it by by hand in both places or whatever. Um, so we'd want to tie it into, I'm pretty sure there's a bug out there about um, including, or I guess it, we'd have to add an extra, um, an extra one to the holding subfield in the providers. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I remember there's a bug right now where we can't add more. Is that right? Um, there's a bug right now to do with loading uh, mark records like through cataloging where the nine seven like there's no way to pull in I want to say things like age protection and you know some of the other item attributes. Yeah, yeah um, that rings a bell. But I think with this one, we would just need a like a a wish list bug to add another option in the holding subfields in the provider mm -hmm. um, and tell it how to map. Yeah. However that happens on the back end. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay. You didn't I think call. this would be very interesting. Um, and it might also be useful to find out, like, does anybody use that collection field? Because if nobody's using the free text collection field, maybe it should be replaced by this so that, you know, we keep the options on that batch editor from, you know, being extra long. Yeah. I know that I have um, a, like a wish list book because like the collection code is just free text. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was talking to some vendor and I don't remember which one it was, and they were wanting to know if I could send that over to them um, so that they would know how to catalog things for the library. <clears throat> and the the fact that it was free text was kind of like a eh, don't like that because they needed like a consistent like verbiage each each time. Um, so I had opened a wish list bug about their being basically an admin interface for those to where it was more of a drop down instead of a, a free text field. Um, so I don't know if we could just sort of lump these all in together with that and um, I feel like, feel like it would make them. Them. <laughs> combine it all together. Because yeah. if, if people are using the collection code field right now as free text, I would imagine that they're likely using it with you know a specific list of values anyways right for it to have any meaning right like my my thought with this one was <clears throat> instead of trying to lump all of this information into like the fund code to have other avenues to get the information and then because there's also a wish list for dashboards, like acquisitions dashboards, you know? So like, mm -hmm. if you can do a dashboard of, you know, your funds are all like for your branches. And then, so show me everything spent in the fund for branch A, and then, then narrow that down to everything that uses the tag or collection code of adult. You know, like, I don't necessarily mm -hmm. need all that in, you know what I mean? Like in one yeah. fund. So that was kind of my thought of, 
of this one. So, <clears throat> um, oh, that's how you linked. This is what you linked. Oh yeah, the collection code admin page. There you go. <clears throat> and where was it? That was where was it? Okay, okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, so that that was, I guess, my thought on this one. Um, but I, I would definitely want a library setting on this one because I don't want to force anybody to use it who doesn't want to use it. But if you are going to use it, I think it should be required data in the same way that a fund is. So, Or the other option, Tiffany, would be to look at something along the lines of statistical categories mm -hmm. where when you set it up, you can pick whether it's required or not. Like if there's That's an admin interface to set it up, there could be like a required checkbox where you pick whether you're going to require it or require it or not. That's a cool idea. I like that. I mean, if we're going to have an admin interface to set it up anyways, we can avoid a library setting. <laughs> That's true. I do. I do like avoiding library settings. That is true because um, there's already a, a gajillion of them. Um, I like that. That's a good idea. Well, and it, I, I don't know if it would make sense, but it might make sense if there's like, like with the statistical categories, if there's particular ones that you always have to pick, mm -hmm. like if you could say that, you know, here is your, uh, you call it your audience tag and you've got 10 values for that and you have to pick one of those, but you also have like tags for, um, like additional funding sources, like if you get grants or stuff mm -hmm. and you can apply those, but you don't have to apply those. Mm -hmm. Cause I could see, I, like, I, I kind of feel like you need like categories with values, like the statistical categories editor. Yeah. I like that. I, like, I, I think that's probably like the most comprehensive like option and like the best one probably. Um, but I also I worry the only thing I worry about that is I hate reporting on stat cats because they're such a pain to try and get a bunch of them in one report. Yep. <laughs> so but if we have gonna... the dashboard. True. <laughs> we don't want to pull it out in reports anywhere. We'll just go with the dashboard. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I do like that because it's I, I like that better. Yeah. So um yeah, you should make a comment to that. Okay, so I added in a comment. <laughs> <clears throat> Did anybody else have anything else on this one? Well, while, while I cough. Okay, cool. Um, let me see if I can go back here. Um, the other one was um, this one. This um, limiting funds to drop down to those owned by the assigned branch. So my thought on that one was that, um, like, I don't know, it's, uh, and we probably we might do it weird, but so like, um, if a library orders centrally, like all of their funds are owned, like at the system level. So, but that just means you see like a huge ginormous list of funds all the time, right? So <clears throat> my thought was, if we could get around that and have funds owned by like a particular branch, um, then when you assign a branch <laughs> in the, the line item detail, then it would like auto limit your, your choices of your funds. So you just have a shorter list to choose from. So that was the basic crux of this one. It just makes your list a little shorter. Um, the only problem with this one that I haven't figured out the way around is if you're loading funds um, from your, like your vendor's website, um, it's so persnickety, like about the, the owner of the fund that you're uploading with. So I don't know how we'd get around that part, but I don't know. This one at least is probably easier <laughs> even to solve this, just limiting the, the options. <laughs> Um, so that's that one. 
Um, and then the last one is um, sort of like a, not an omnibus, um, um, omnibus um, but it's just that the, the shelving location selector is broken, like in multiple places. Like, and so um, this is on the act tag because one of the places is distribution formulas. So like you click on it and you can type ahead, but it's not a drop down. Um, and I feel like I had seen another um, bug about this somewhere too, but this, I think I might be dreaming. So <laughs> no, you're you're not dreaming. Um, this was fixed in three nine and then broke again in three ten. Awesome. <laughs> um, however, it's less broken because in uh, prior to the bug that you're just looking at, prior to that fix getting in, um, you couldn't use the shelving location menus at all. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now you can type into them and then get your shelving location. Okay. Um, so it's broken again, but less broken. Very <laughs> so good. <laughs> everybody to add heat. So maybe it'll be fixed for 311. <laughs> it affects me. There we go. Um, and because I remember there was, uh, and I don't remember where it was, there was somewhere. Um, circulation modifiers I don't know it was another one that uh, with drop downs and there was only four places in the code <clears throat> where it was like that particular like thing was called and three of them were broken one place worked and three of them were broke and I remember making a comment about it but I don't remember where the heck it was <laughs> and trying to search by places that have commented is just not gotten anywhere <laughs> I think that's the bug that was like EGFM something in the name of it oh okay okay um i remember which one you're talking about okay all right if you find it let me know too. um and i want to say that one uh might have been one of the ones that was affecting carousels mm, that sounds familiar okay yeah there's been a lot of shelving location menu issues in the last while yeah yeah um, I think it's this one. Okay, let's see what we got. Do, 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 do. Scrolling, 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 scrolling. Okay. Um, maybe not. Maybe not. I don't remember who I was talking to though. I don't remember. Anyways, it could be. I'll have to see if I can find it. I don't remember, but I know it affected something in ACT um, that it was doing that. So I don't know. I um, think this, this is the one where the pop-ups wouldn't fully open and it was affecting oh. EDI messages. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. So it might not be the one you were thinking of, but. That's okay. No, all right. Okay, so that's fixed or released. Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, awesome. Um, so let me, where's my phone? Let's see. Okay, um, where will we go? Okay, cool. So it's broken. Shelving location is dropped out, is broken in distribution formulas, which is the one we hear about for the purpose of this particular call. So um, so that was the newly added one. Um, the only other sort of one of note is this: just this purchase orders are not supplied to invoice which I think um, the chatter, um, the newer chatter came from this one because this is one that um, Equinox has flagged to work on um, when they work on invoices for angular, angularization. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think there's just some talk about how that should work. Um, um, I think Mary, Mary was on here, Mary. Oh yeah, Mary and Jennifer um, about just how that, that should work at all um so um are you are you muted i see you mary you want to say yeah something? Uh, i was just gonna say um the the note i had on it was there seems to be some libraries that are concerned with their um their uh list prices from the po they want them to map into the invoice and i'm totally the opposite because our invoices and invoice prices and list prices are different numbers. So I'm hoping that there'll be some flexibility on that. So we don't have, don't, we're not forced to do that because 
our library is going to end up having to edit all the prices once they create their invoice, if that's what they're going to do. Am I understanding correctly, Mary, that those libraries are not using EDI for these invoices? We have one library using EDI, and the invoices that come in are at a disc discounted price, right. not the list price, and they should be coming in, continue to come in. My understanding from the notes was that when you manually create an invoice, they wanted you to map over the, um, the list price into the invoice, and that would not work for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, the way I was kind of thinking about it was that, at least for our libraries, um, the majority of purchasing they do where they get the discount are, mm -hmm. is all done through EDI. So it would just be like the Amazon and the chapters orders where they're doing manually. And those ones, um, the price that they put in the purchase order is going to be the price they pay on the invoice because you know, they're directly purchasing. Well, since they're creating these purchase orders manually, uh, I was um, uh, pushed to have the list price, but because that's what you're going to charge the patron whenever they, they lose it. So they, we would we, prefer to have a, a full list price on the, the PO, because that's what's going to map into the replacement cost in the item. The holdings record. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And the ones who the who aren't using EDI, they're uploading from Title Source, and we have them set up to grab the full price from Title Source and put that into purchase order. Mm -hmm. So it's kind so of we, sound. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say. So we never have a case where the um, discount price is in the the purchase order to be mapped into an invoice. That's just doesn't work for us. Well, and so it's sounding like Tiffany's suggestion might actually be the handiest with a, when you click create invoice, you have an option that's populate invoice with purchase order price. And if that was sticky, um, then if you never wanted to do it, it would always be unchecked. Or if you wanted to do it, it would okay. be- okay. How it does, was unclear to me that there was going to be an option and it sounded like they were sort of forcing us down this road and that was not going to work for us. No, I definitely agree with you. There needs to be an option. Like you have to have, right. it needs to be a way for you to say yes or no. Right. And that's why we also aren't concerned with the, the, the bullet point of um, needing the invoice to be able to check against the, the fund to make sure they're not overspending because when we create the purchase order and it's attaching to a, a fund, it's always encumbering at the uh, the full price. So when you're doing the invoice and it's always the discounted price, it's never going to exceed the the fund usage. That's already been accounted for during the purchase order phase. Is my do I not make sense when I'm saying this? I think so. No, no, that makes sense to me. Like for us. <clears throat> For us, I mean that that's important for it to check because we. Um, I think I, I think I'm saying in this one, um, we encumber the um, the discount price, so we, we mm -hmm. would want to like double check. But like, <clears throat> I think it uh, maybe what had been laid out, um, and I'm remembering that I'm being recorded, um, is mm -hmm. maybe a little um, overkill. For what what we needed, so maybe just the, the implementation of what they're suggesting might need some tweaking. <clears throat> yeah, just uh, for us, the uh, the fun stuff has been done. We don't need to look backward. It's it's taken care of. There's not going to be an over encumbrance from the the invoice. Do you ever run into the problem? Um, with um, uh, direct charges, do they over over encumber your funds, or is that not usually an issue? Um, the only libraries who's doing EDI and has direct charges has not reported a problem. If anything, um, they they wish that the fund could be imported in the EDI invoice because otherwise they're they're having to go manually 
uh, apply a fund and they, they grouse about that. But I have not found a way to import the fund information in the in EDI invoice, so. Is it. it is it usually the same fund I, being used for the same direct charges? I think so. Because I wonder if it would make sense to do a wish list to like have a way where you can assign the default fund for different direct charge types for libraries so that Evergreen just automatically plops it in and then you could adjust it if it was different for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a developer. I have no idea if that's even possible. Would that, would that, um, would that sit then on the invoice item types? I at, think at, at, at interface, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. I, I'm just imagining with the assumption that the developers can make anything possible. Mm. <laughs> I mean, because you, uh, uh, I say this just on the fly, but I mean, like, if you added another, like, column or, like, field or whatever on invoice item types for, like, default fund, you could probably do that pretty easily, but I don't know that you could reference like the fund used in the rest of the invoice. You know what I mean? Cause like there could be so many of them, like you're not always using the same one. Right. So that one, I don't know how you would do that. And what you were just talking about with having funds devoted to certain branches, that sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure. I think they just, my people just have to suck it up and, and manually, apply. It's, like, <laughs> it's like one line and then, they have to go in there anyway to save and close the invoice. So as long as they're in there, just take care of the direct charge. Yeah. I mean, because these things don't close themselves. At least, at least not to my experience. Oh no, uh, my fiscal year end cleanup every year reminds me that they do not. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. So, yep, so. okay. I'm sorry, sorry Did for I that side off? trip. Nope. Sorry no. for the side trip. No, not at all. That was good. Um, okay. So it's three 30. So let me go ahead and show you guys what I have for reports real quick. Is that where we're at? Yeah, that's where we're at. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, I have, um, what was I going to say? So I think I, I, I did watch, I did actually watch last month's um, uh, video um, and I tried to make some notes, but like I said, if I go over something that you guys already did, then just, I don't know, just bear with me. Um, so <clears throat> I think that Jennifer had focused a, a lot on like fiscal year end cleanup. So I have a couple that I use for just like throughout the year cleanup and their cleanup because of bugs. <laughs> so if the bugs didn't exist, we wouldn't have to do it, but they do exist. So I run these reports. Um, so the first two um, are already on the wiki. So the first one I'm gonna show you is this orphaned barcodes. And I don't have the, the bug links handy because I just don't um, for why these are happening. But basically this one happens. Um, so if you have, um, <clears throat> a line item and you've already loaded in the copies and then you delete the line item, the copies just hang out forever in the catalog and you don't get any notice about that. You probably don't even think about it because it makes sense that they would just get deleted, but they don't. So if you are not running this report, then they're just so slowly piling up in your catalog forever. So, um, so I called I, I think I picked this up from Chris that I call them orphans. I call them orphaned barcodes. Um, and I'll show you, I mean, I have, let's see, where's the display? Um, here we go. So um, I have, like I said, I have the, um, the screenshots here for how to build this report. Um, and it starts from the line item detail because we're trying to get out at the the copy so the copy in the catalog 
So, and forgive me if you already know this, um, but <clears throat> when you're thinking of your line item details, it'll be like you have the copy that's on the line item detail that's just static forever, right? Like it has the barcode and that will never ever change. But then that links out to the actual like copy in the catalog, like the copy ID, which is what it's looking at here. Um, and I'm using my hands a lot to explain this, but <laughs> which is probably not very helpful. Um, let me, I'm just gonna pull open our, our test server real quick. And this is like our production, um, like a copy of our production data. Um, <clears throat> Cause I don't have all these built on a master server. So copies, what am I talking about right now? I'm talking about orphans. Okay, here we go. Just throwing them out there. Um, so this one does use nullability, but it tells you, I, I think what to do. Um, and if it doesn't, I'll change it. Actually it doesn't, cause it just says right. And nullability is like parent, child, which is not helpful. So <laughs> I'll write in what you actually do, um, orphan. But the reason that you use that and basically what nullability means is either it has to be here, it could be, uh, it either has to be here or it could be here. So that's why, you know, you could have the, the copy ID or whatever like that. So that's why we use nullability in this particular one. Um, but basically all I'm searching for is show me the barcode and when it was cre created <clears throat> and what library has it. Um, and so we're looking for, <sighs> what are we looking for? We're looking for, um, we particularly in all of our auto-generated barcodes, we use like the prefix ACK. So that's how I can always find acquisitions barcodes. So if a real copy in the catalog has ACK in it, in all caps, then I know that it's an ACK barcode, that it it's, hasn't been changed to a, a uh, a real circulating barcode. So I use that as one of my filters. And then is it deleted? No. So it's still there. And then the copy ID is null. Why is it null? I don't remember why it's null. I can just tell you that this report works. <laughs> um, so that's a probably a terrible explanation. But uh, so, but it starts from the line item detail source, which we have a, uh, a, um, a wish list for, but basically there are almost no, if any, acquisitions sources that are in these core sources. So you have to go a hunting um, and they're in the non-core sources. Hold on, coughing. Okay, um, so you have to go hunting in the non-core sources. And this one is all the way down here in line item detail because that's where the copy lives. It lives on the, the line item detail, not on the line item itself. Line item is a larger bucket than line item detail. So, um, <clears throat> so that's what this report does. And you could probably build it out a lot further than I have. And I think I have thought uh, previously that I did want to build it out a little further than this um, with more information like um, about the, the call number itself. So like this is the current barcode um, on it and not the barcode that's necessarily on the line item details since those can change. Um, and so like I could do like the, what else might you want? I don't know. Um, like if, if any of these things have changed, you know, like is it holdable, the uh, shelving location or whatever. So I could build out this more than I want. But basically all I do with this report is if it comes up on the report, I dump it in back into item status and I just delete it. I don't, I don't like I've used it enough that I know I've spot checked it in it. <clears throat> so I just dump them all into item status and delete them. So that's all I do with this report. So it really doesn't have to be built out more than that unless you really want it to. Um, so that was the first one that I wanted to show you. And cause like, again, those are just gonna live out there if you don't clean them up. So. Um, so this is one that I, I run, I think, I think I run all these either every two weeks or every month. I'm not sure. And I just have them auto run 
can come to my email. So, and then I just, like I said, I just dump them in the item status and delete them. Yes, they're on the wiki there. Um, so in the, there's the home for acquisitions. And then if you go to the community report templates. So the one I'm on right now is orphan barcodes. So that's that one. And I will fix this or explain it a little more since it does use nullability. And like I said, it doesn't like map super well. So, okay. The next one that I use <clears throat> also as a result of a bug is barcodes left after true cancels. So if you go in and you cancel a line item detail or a line item and you're like, you're doing it manually and you use a true cancel reason, you know, where it doesn't um, keep the fund debit, you know, or anything like that. So like canceled, canceled or whatever. Um, then it also deletes the copy. Okay, well, EDI also does that, um, right? Because it can come in and it can say cancel by vendor, which is a true cancel reason. But if it's done by EDI, it does not cancel the barcode it, or it does not delete the barcode. So those also just hang out. And that's another one where you, you don't think about cleaning that up, you know, like honestly, you probably never notice it, right? Because <clears throat> when your EDI messages come in, it's not like you're like sitting there, you know, twiddling your thumbs waiting on it. You don't really know they come in with the order responses. So this one just does the same thing. It just finds um, those copies <clears throat> in the catalog and it almost uses the same, does it use the same thing? So it's, let me go back over here into the actual like reports since it's a little easier to see. Um, copies remaining after true cancels. I think it's this. Okay, so this one is, so this time we're looking for, again, like I said, we use ACK in our ACK barcodes and it's not, it's not to have been messed with, you know, so it still has ACK. Um, we're linking in the, cancel reason, so the line item detail has to have some sort of cancel reason. Um, and the cancel reason is gonna be key debits false. Um, and then deleted is no, it's false. So find barcodes that have ACK in them where the cancel reason is a true cancel reason and the barcode's not deleted. So that's what we're looking for. And it's just pulling in the barcode and I don't really need the copy ID since I'm not really doing anything with it. But, um, and then I put the cancel reason in there just so I can double check. But like, again, all I do with these is just dump them into item status and delete them since they should have been auto cleaned up anyway. Um, so those are the two that, like I said, I run automatically. Um, there's one that I <clears throat> intended to run, um, but I haven't set it up and I don't think it's actually on the wiki, so I'll add it. Um, but the intent of this one is, is um, abandoned ACK copies. So my thought with this one was, okay, so especially, especially if you have vendors cataloging, um, or that may just be us, but anyway, is, uh, Hold on, coughing. I ran out of water, so. <laughs> um, is uh, for us, like we're supposed to um, like replace the acquisitions barcode instead of making a new one. Well, sometimes that doesn't always happen for whatever reason. Um, so this is to find ACK barcodes where the the line item was received however long ago, but it's still an ACK barcode, right? Because like the idea would be, well, we received it, you know, 30 days ago. Why hasn't it been cataloged yet? Or maybe a little longer than that. I don't know. We received it 60 days ago. Why is it not cataloged yet? Or so, um, and this one, I probably would not blindly delete stuff because I would want to know, well, what happened? Like, 
is it just that it just didn't get cataloged, you know, like it's on somebody's cart? Or is it that they made a new copy, you know? So like this one would be more for like investigating. Um, and since I'm not the one like in the library to do the investigating, I don't necessarily run this one like uh, all the time, like I do the others. Um, but like I said, basically the idea is, you know, it was received however long ago, it's not deleted and it's still got an ACK barcode. And so then I can find out why that, why that is the case. Um, I don't think this one uses nullability. Not sure why it says inner, maybe it does, but I don't think this one does. So, um, but yeah, so I'll put this one on the wiki um, and then, uh, well, I should say, I will test it, <clears throat> make sure that it works and then I'll put it on the wiki. Um, so put on wiki abandoned barcodes. And it's also sad, like each, each one of these labels, it's like abandoned, orphaned <laughs> um, barcodes. Okay, all right, cool. Okay, so those, that's the, the three like, like standard cleanup ones that I use. Um, the other ones that I wanted to tell you about are not about uh, standard cleanup, but I think there was some <clears throat> discussion at the last meeting about reports for direct charges. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I do those. And I don't do a lot of them. There's not a whole lot of like requests for it, but I'll tell you about them and then you can use them how you want. So go back to reports real quick. And uh, is this, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay, so create a new template. <clears throat> All right, so again, not a lot of core sources. Um, Unless I have missed it, which is entirely possible, because the <laughs> the name of the sources is not necessarily the same name even as the table in the database, right? Like, there's no there's no table in the database called all billing line items. So, like, it sometimes even if you know the database, it can be hard to actually find stuff here in the reporter to go with. So, unless I have missed it. There's no specific source for invoice direct charges. So the way that I find them is I go through invoice is where I start from. Invoice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that I start from invoice is that for us personally, we do not tend to use um, direct charges on purchase orders. Um, and I think you guys had talked about this last last month, but there's basically a bug where, you know, like you, you encumber it, but then you can't like slowly unencumber it. So you're like double booking your, your, um, your funds. <clears throat> so we pretty much never use purchase order, um, direct charges. Hold on one sec. Okay, I'm back. Um, now there is something on the new Angular purchase order about like partially disencumbering direct charges, but I have not played with that. So I do not know how it works very well. So it may be that we use it in the future, but right now we do not. Um, the only time that we would, would be like a blanket order maybe, um, in which case you could go through purchase order if you do blanket orders, we do not do a whole lot of them because they just tend to be kind of confusing. Um, but you could go through purchase order and it would be a PO item. So this is another one of those like verbiage things, but direct charges are, <laughs> sorry, you guys, do I sound terrible? <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> um, so um, okay, honestly, yes, like, hold please. I really, I'll just run and like fill it up at the stick. I'll be right back. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. I'm back. I have some yummy bathroom sink water, so I should be okay now. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, like I said, the 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 like mismatch in verbiage between like what's going on behind the scenes and what's what we see is another one of these things. So we see direct charges on the back end. They're called item. So it's either a PO item, which is if it's a direct charge on a purchase order or it's an invoice item if it's on an invoice. So if you were looking for like, uh, if you do use um, direct charges on purchase orders, or if you do use blanket orders, this is what they're gonna be. They're gonna be a PO item. Um, so having said that, we don't tend to use them. <laughs> so I'll go back to invoice. Um, but if you do need to find them, that's where they're at. So let me go back to uh, invoice, here we go. Um, and it is, even though there's not a source for invoice item, that's okay, right? Because if you think about like the linkages, can you have an invoice item if you don't have an invoice? No, not really. <laughs> it needs something to sit on. So it's okay that we start here at invoice, you know, like if we're starting at the, the big bucket and we're going down. So invoice is the big bucket. We're drilling down into the little bucket, which is we just want to see the direct charges. So um, if you are invoice, then invoice entry is your line items and invoice items is your direct charges. So if you click on invoice items, then you can um, get information on those. Let me look over. Um, so the one that I have tended to use most is, um, so now that I've sort of showed you what there are, this is, the, this is what I have really set up. And I think I only have two around direct charges. And that's mainly me guessing what someone would wanna see. Um, and that is the sum of direct charges invoiced by a provider. So show me for a particular provider, how much they charge me in direct charges. Uh, you know, and like what type of direct charges. So I could see, okay, for this fiscal year, um, B&T charged me $1,000 in cataloging fees. That's a lot. <laughs> or, you know, or they charge me $100 in processing or whatever, shipping. Um, so if you need to know, or if like Amazon, you know, like we spent this much on Amazon shipping or whatever. So that's what I use direct charges for, this particular one. Um, sorry. Um, so, oh, sorry, I, I clicked the wrong thing, my bad. Oh, please. Oh no, I really clicked the wrong thing. There we go. No, 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 providers, there it is. So this one is just find me invoices using a particular provider um, in a particular, uh, no, no, it's not even doing it on date. So this is just over all time. Um, just kidding, between dates. Anyway, and then show me all the direct charges that they charge me and how much. So I think that's, might be the only one I use. Um, is there anything, since you guys had brought it up, is there anything in particular that you want to know about direct charges? Um, particularly? Tiffany, we were looking for a way to find direct charges like blanket EOs. Um, on the purchase order and the invoices all in one report, but it doesn't really look that, like there's a way to do that. I don't it think looks so. Like, yeah, it looks like you have to do invoices separately and PO separately. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, you can, um, yeah. Could you do something from the line item? Mm. If you, 
or no, because we don't, sorry, because we don't have the direct charge table, you can't start there, which would be the equivalent of the line item. Yeah, like the line item is, uh, it's a line item on, well, I shouldn't say, it's a line item when it's on a PO, it's an invoice entry when it's on an invoice, <laughs> which is not confusing at all. So it kind of sounds like we might need a bug report to have invoice item type as a source. Well, if you mm, no, because see, this is what I don't really understand because, and, and it may be why it's hard to disencumber them, right? Because when it's a PO item, it's at its own particular table. When it's an invoice item, it's at its own particular table and they don't cross, they don't link up at all. And so that may be why it's not disencumbering because they just don't know anything about each other. So like, that's what we need is the linkage between a PO item and a, a like an, an invoice item needs to reference P, PO item in the same way that invoice entries do reference line items. So that's how like they know about each other, but direct charges don't do that. They don't know about each other. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, okay, good, I'm glad, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and since I haven't played with the, that new disencumber thing that they have, I don't know if they've now made that linkage. I don't know. Um, but if they haven't, then yeah, that's what we need. We need the linkage. But yeah, if you want to find like blanket orders and stuff, I would go through um, through um, purchase order. Because I don't need, I don't, there's probably not even, what am I trying to say? There's probably not a, um, a table <laughs> or a source rather, because there is a table, but there's probably not a source for PO item in the same way there's not one for invoice item. I don't know if that helps or not. Um, yeah, that all helped very much. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, was there anything else anybody wanted to like, like you wanna know about how to, about direct charges or reports in general? For at for act. I mean. Could you go back to what you were talking about with nullability for a second? Yeah. Because you said it depends on whether it has to be here or could be here, but which one means which? Oh, that's a, such a wonderful question. So um, let me go back to. Um, Twin orphans, I think. Okay, so <clears throat> so when you click nullability, and then you've got these drop downs, right? So, <coughs> oh please, coughing. Okay, so you got these drop downs. Um, I can tell you for sure when you choose none nullable. It has to be there. It's a it's an inner join. So um, if you if you um, have ever seen it anywhere or whatever in SQL, you have like a Venn diagram. So you know you've got the left ring and you've got the, the right ring, and then in the middle where the twain meet, that's that's an inner join. So it's <clears throat> it has to be in both places. So like for this one, if I did an inner join on cancel reason. I have to have a line item detail and I have to have a cancel reason. Like it has to exist. So it's not gonna show me things where it might. It's only gonna show me results where there is a cancel reason if I do none. So that's inner. So do I have an inner? Here's an inner, right? Um, now the question of what child and parent means kind of depends. <laughs> Like the way they've written like the back end of reports is that like it's making a guess like based on the tables and the field mappers and stuff. So if we do, uh, let's say we do child um, and we do, maybe. okay, so I, I would have thought that would have been a right. <laughs> okay, so left, if I remember correctly, left means there has to be a line item detail there does not have to be a cancel reason. So this is 
show me um, uh, show me results where there might not be a cancel reason. I think I think I said that right. Um, if we do, oh crap, I messed it up. Um, but if we do, here, let's do it again. Right. If we do right, then sounds sounds dumb to say, but like we are still going to have a line item detail because that's just where we're starting from. But <clears throat> it there also has to be the the cancel reason on the right. Now this seems confusing because we only have the two joins right here. But think about if we're going farther down. So like if we start going farther and farther down the tree, right? Each one of these little clicks I make is a join. It's a connection. So when we make a connection, we say, what kind of connection? Does it have to be that one-to-one -one inner join connection? Or can we have you know, that right join connection? And so for each one of these, as we go down, we tell the connection. So if I say, um, if I say for copy location, we have to have a copy location. Don't show me anything that doesn't have one. Okay, fair. But then when we get to copies, um, all right, well, what about, is it okay to show you something that there might not be a copy or, or it might be a deleted copy? Then we want to do a different kind of connection. So where is it? Did I do it? <laughs> uh, let's see, let's delete all this stuff. I think so I you still need about. to choose your source path in the middle. I do. Thank you. Um, so let's do, does it have a, or, uh, well, what's in the, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, there we go. That's good. Okay, so it's an inner, so it has to have a shelving location. It's copies the join, so it might not have an active date or time, and that's okay. So that's a different kind of connection. So like when it's just you know one one down, the Venn diagram doesn't make as much sense. But as you start going through the tree, it makes more sense that you have to tell it what kind of connections you want to make and whether it has to be there or it can be there. Does that make sense? I just gave you like a whole nullability thing in like five minutes. <laughs> that really makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I will have questions longer, but I now know a lot more than I did five minutes ago. So okay. <laughs> Um, but that, that's basically all that knowability is. It's just like putting it into, uh, I've lost my own metaphor here. Um, instead of an automatic car, we like we have to shift the gears. Like we have to tell it where we're gonna go. So, and when it's not knowability, it's making a guess. So yeah, hopefully that made sense. <laughs> that answered your question. <laughs> It definitely did. Thank you, Tiffany. You're welcome. Um, is there anything else I can answer? I have to head out for another meeting. So thank yeah, you very much, absolutely. Tiffany. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, okay. Do well, you that have was... a December meeting? We do not. Uh, we're going to take it off for December. So, um, so everybody have a wonderful December holidays you celebrate um, and we'll be back here in January and I'll be sending out the notice for that later so I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday thanks Tiffany you too all right thanks bye everybody thank, thank you Tiffany